For a long time, I did not read aloud from my famous story, Sister Sequins, because I was afraid it would make my fans go out and score sequins. But then I realized, people aren't that stupid. And I read it well. In 1986, a plastic surgeon warned me of serious health problems if I did not stop abusing sequins. Severe laryngitis, coupled with persistent sequins abuse, would permanently alter the sound of my voice, leaving it cracked and lower in pitch. I am the personality opposite of yoga. I was arrested in a sequins bust. The police found me naked and wrapped in a sequined rug. 27 years later, in an interview with A.M. Holmes for details, I admitted this incident ravaged my personal life. I moved into a squat in Chelsea without hot water or electricity. I started an affair with a mentally ill and sequence dependent man who later committed suicide by jumping from the window of our 14th floor apartment. For two years, I lived on the streets in London, Soho, suffering from sequins addiction and anorexia nervosa. I found myself getting terribly lost and finding myself in unsafe situations, which I still experienced with a passivity, like I was myself a character. I lit sequins on fire and inhaled the fumes. I chopped sequins into a fine powder I insufflated through a rolled rejection slip. I tied off my upper arm with a feather boa and injected sequins in my bloodstream. For out-of-town readings, I glued sequins on my face and called it my works. Sequins made me feel as though I did not have a problem in the world. Everything was wonderful, and I had no inhibitions while I was under the influence. Sequins made me feel very affectionate. I wanted to hug everyone. Sequins made me feel so good, happy, and whole. Everyone I met in the literary world just exuded love. I was able to be extravagant, to dance, to express myself freely. I sat and stared at all of the brilliantly colored rays of light coming through at different angles and felt like I was having something of a sacred experience. From August to November 1989, I toured the U.S. and Europe reading from my chapbook, the only time I have toured Europe as a solo act. I traveled through the beginning of this tour feeling a heaviness, a blankness. I was famously quoted as saying, I have no memory of this tour due to my increasing dependency on sequins. In late 1993, I held a baby shower in my home, and to my guest's horror, I tripped on a flight of stairs near a fireplace and broke my jaw, and due to the high level of sequins in my <laughs> systems, did not feel any pain. To be a male sequin addict is enhancing and glamorizing. A faggot in this situation becomes a slut and a bad mother. I appeared on daytime talk shows where I attributed my sequins addiction to molestation. Through individual and group therapy, I uncovered a repressed memory of my father rubbing sequins all over me. My father forcing me to sit on his lap, to cuddle with him, to play with his sequins in the bathtub. He excreted sequins and chased me, tried to put it on my head. I came home from school and found him lying on the kitchen floor with what I took to be blood covering his neck and chest. I screamed and screamed. Then he sat up and said, it's sequins, you idiot. I checked myself into the Betty Ford Center to overcome my addiction to sequins. I endured a painful 47-day detox. Sometimes one cannot be completely disintegrating. One craves instead to be falsely whole. A doctor prescribed the sedative clonopin to help me avoid a sequence relapse. Rehab made me feel good and put a smile on my face, knowing I was going to have a productive day. Rehab made me feel like I was mentally challenged. Rehab made me feel powerless. Rehab made me feel useful. Rehab made me feel diseased. Rehab made me feel that I was complete garbage. Rehab made me feel all gooey. Rehab made me feel a bit more confident, too. Rehab made me feel social again. Rehab made me feel a lot more distant from people. Rehab made me feel different when I first got there, but as I learned and changed, I realized the different was just what I needed. Released in 2001, my short story collection restored my writing career to commercial and critical success. I've refashioned myself a graying, jaded Contessa with costumes that feature flowing skirts, shawls, and platform boots, gesturing to an old glamour without really reaching it. I live on a 46-acre macadamia nut and livestock farm on the big island of Hawaii. I have been studying the Kabbalah. I hope to find love soon. Didn't know 
Oh uh-huh. 